Well, it's time for another learning session. This one's going to be in track A only. There is no track B and track C happening right now because what we're about to experience is a lot of learning from the inventor of the platypod, Larry T. Larry Tiefenbrun. Dr. T is going to be on for the next hour and showing you just awesome images and also behind the scenes of how these images were created and captured. Now, what you're going to want to do is take notes. I know you guys have been off and on taking notes throughout the day, and then some of you have been thinking, well, um, I think I'm just going to watch the replay to get what I'm learning back. Well, in this session, there are going to be a lot of resources provided. So you're going to learn about places that you can go, books and um, audio books and uh, all kinds of things that you can learn from websites. And you'll want to maybe screen capture or jot these things down. So make sure you get something to take notes with. This session is going to teach you things about food photography and macro photography and interior real estate photography and product shot photography. So if any of those are of interest to you, and they better be, you're at Photoshop World, you're going to have a great experience here. And then also Dr. T has resources for how to step into making money with these things. There's going to be all kinds of great stuff. Then after this session is a session with Joe McNally, and then later tonight, the craziness happens starting at 10 o'clock. That's midnight madness. But as we get into this session, it's going to be different. So if you've been to any of the Kelby One two-day events or two-and-a-half-day events in the past, you know that uh, Platypod sponsors some things and says, here's some really cool ways to use Platypod products, and here are some parts to those kits and those kinds of things. But what you're going to see today is even more education than you're used to. So that's about to happen in about 30 seconds. We're going to bring Dr. T, the platypod inventor, on with us, and uh, you'll see an awful lot of great learning material. So let's go ahead and step in. We're going to get into learning all about those types of photography I just mentioned. Food photography, macro photography, product shot photography, and interior real estate photography with the inventor of the platypod, the coolest tripod alternative on the planet. Dr. T, it's an honor to have you here with us. Hi, Larry, and it's an honor to be here. I've been watching in and out several of the presentations, and to be among such legends in photography is truly an honor. And I'm just glad to have everybody here. If you've ever heard my talks before, this is nothing like any of the other talks we've had. We're going to be broaching all kinds of new subjects, and I hope you'll stick with me throughout the show. As Larry said, take out a pad and a piece of paper, or just you'll take a picture of the uh, screen as it comes up, because we're going to give you a lot of in, a lot of educational resources to look at, and I'm hoping to whet everybody's appetite into getting into food photography, product photography, and interior real estate photography. I've learned so much preparing for this, and I think you'll all learn a whole lot too. So let's dive right in. As First, uh, as a little bit of nostalgia. As you're getting into this, Dr. T, I want to point out, you guys can put questions into the Q&A, and then those are going to be electronically given to me as we're starting to wrap up the hour, and then I'll be able to ask Dr. T the actual questions that you're asking right here on the spot. So feel free to use that Q&A during this session to ask any questions that come to your mind. Sorry, Dr. T, please continue. Yes, that's okay. And by the way, if you happen to be, if you happen to be watching this in the replay, uh, if you have questions, you can send them to service at platypod.com and we'll be happy to answer your questions myself or my CMO, Mr. Skip Cohen. All right, again, a little bit of nostalgia here. Uh, you'll, you'll probably take notice the right lower hand corner the first time I met Larry Becker in person at Photoshop World 2015 when we first introduced the very first platypod. Uh, lower center picture, I just have regards to all of you from Dave Williams out in England preparing to take his new uh, van that he's gonna be living in for the next year or two 
uh, all the way out throughout Europe. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner, I think you'll all recognize the, the great uh, Jay Maisel. And if you can figure out who's in that middle picture with me, you know what? Let's make it fun. Why don't you type it into the chat and see who recognizes who's in that uh, picture there? All right, next. And we'll go right in. Uh, you're, most of you are familiar with the Platypod ecosystem. You probably uh, have one. And we will. Re I'll refer you to our website for more information on that. We'll introduce some of our products and some new products a little later on. But really, this is mostly to talk about photography. So when you go out for dinner, you have your phone with you at the very least, or take a camera with you and take a picture of your food, especially if it's something really interesting like this. When I was out with my wife, Minna, uh, at a seaside restaurant and out came dessert, and I thought this fudge laced milkshake was just gorgeous and opening up the aperture to, I believe it was F1.7, 1.8, I was able to blur out the background, get this beautiful bokeh, and just take this lovely image, which was very simply lit by one spotlight off a building behind me and another street light uh, off in the distance. I put this picture, of, I did this years and years ago to illustrate uh, some points. If you're interested in getting into product photography of any type, take a ball or take an egg, as I did. And also, if you want to put in the chat uh, your uh, thoughts on how I got that egg to stand up and stay standing independently, we'd love to hear if you can guess how, how we did it, uh, for those of you who I've never told in person. But anyhow, take an egg, light it from the side, light it from in front, from an angle, above, below, explore and see how light can define your subject and how the shadows define it even further. All I did, I took this egg, stood it up, I took a piece of background paper, and 50% gray background paper, and folded it in half, and overexposed the background paper from one side, exposed the egg properly from the other side, and then just lined up the angles and made this interesting graphic image. There is so much you can do with light, and this image was hardly processed uh, at all. I brought this up again. If you're thinking of getting into product photography, you must learn how to light glass, metal, wood, plastic, and everything in between. And the methods of lighting those different materials is totally different for each one. I will also show you a resource that you can go to to learn this. Now, if you notice the picture in the center and the picture in the left, picture in the center is a little bit more high key. We'll talk about high key and low key a little in a, in a few minutes. And the one on the left is more low key. But notice the glass in the center has a black rim, sort of black edges to it. The image at the left has white edges to it. And one way to produce this is using a sweep of, you can get a sweep of acrylic, uh, such as plexiglass, and kind of bend it and suspend it. You can clamp it onto some sawhorses. And then you take a translucent material like this. This is called Denril, D-E-N-R-I-L. It's a translucent material. Uh, it's kind of plastic, and it's used often by, it used to be used a lot by architects before they had, uh, before they were doing computer uh, design architecture. And it was used for tracing paper. And this is really nice because you can light from behind this onto that, onto that sweep. The stuff is inexpensive and uh, very versatile. When you want to get black uh, edges, as you saw in the center image, well, use some black paper. Or I use something called cinefoil. If you don't have cinefoil, I think I consider this essential equipment for any photographer. This roll, by the way, has lasted me for well over 20 or 30 years. It's basically foil paper that is sprayed with a matte black, and it can be used for backgrounds. It can be used for snoots to focus in your light. It can be used for gobos to block light from certain areas of your photography. 
Very, very versatile material to use. Back to the photo. So to get the middle image, I had a piece of glass that I took from a, uh, a, a picture. And I, lay, I put the, uh, the glass on top of my sweep with the denrel over it, lit from behind. But then to get the black edges, I simply had a large strip of the cinefoil, or you could, you could use black cards to do the same thing, to give that reflection of black against the edges. To get the white edges, you do the opposite. You block off the center light with your cinefoil. And then you have it open at the edges, allowing light to come through. Again, there are different ways to achieve this, but the point is glass has to be lit in certain ways. Well, now, now where can you learn, go to learn Dr. how T, to do this? I, w I wonder, yeah. can we step back to the image of the glasses? On, sure. the, on the all black image on the left, yeah. you have a reflection of the glass under the glass, but you only mentioned using cinefoil. How did you get that reflection so, of the glass. So again, I had I had three layers underneath the uh, subject. What, the first layer at the bottom is clear plexiglass, and that's curved up by suspending it a, a big sheet of, pe of plexiglass that I suspending suspended from some rafters, then curved it down into a sweep by clamping it to some sawhorses. Then I put a sheet of actual glass from the picture frame. Then I laid the glass on top of that. So the reflection you're seeing is actually a reflection off of that picture frame glass. Okay. Now, if you look at the center picture, you also have a reflection there, but it's very, very subtle. Yeah. Much more pronounced on the uh, left-hand uh, dark picture. Does that answer that question, Larry? Yeah, I was just trying to get, a, get my head around where the cinefoil is to create oh, the, the black. I'm sorry, the cinefoil is another layer that, that went right under, it went in between the glass and the denril. So it's plexiglass, denril, cinefoil, then I laid the glass sheet on top of that, and then the goblet on top of that. Gotcha, okay. And then lit from the sides. And then, lit from, and then it's open at the sides, but you don't see that in the picture. All you see is the reflection of the sides coming coming uh, onto the edges. Okay, that makes sense. Good? Okay. So where do you go to learn all this stuff about how to light in product photography? And I'm not going to go much more into this part of it because it's a <laughs> tremendous topic. This is a wonderful book. Every photographer, I think, needs to read this book and know it if you want to know how to do lighting. So it's called Light, Science, and Magic. It's already, I think, in its sixth edition. Um, I have a copy of the book here. I think this is the second or third one I've, I've uh, purchased because I end up giving them away to photography students uh, to read. This is often used as a textbook in colleges uh, for uh, uh, photography courses because it is really so important. And although it is written for anyone in a basic form, um, it will take any photog uh, photographer at any level um, and, and allow you to read that and understand. Next image. This is just simple window lighting, but what Shiv has shown is sometimes it's good to have an extra pair of hands to hold up your subject, like a spoon or a fork, uh, holding up this spaghetti, and he has that on a platypod. So there's a little plug that we'll give for our platypod. Next image is from New York Times photographer Andrew Scrivani, and I asked Andrew to contribute uh, an image here, and he has this sort of zigzag ketchup pattern on this omelet. And I think the zigzag is really what makes this image special. Andrew likes shooting lower key images. Now, for those of you, of you who don't know, low key means the majority of the image is on the dark side of the, uh, of, of the uh, grayscale spectrum, so to speak. So most of the pixels, if you'll look on a histogram here, will be shifted off to the left side. The other thing that's interesting to point out in here is notice how the fork has gone black. This is what happens when you don't light metal. And Andrew did this intentionally, reflecting the light into an angle that doesn't approach the camera so that the fork would go dark and not distract from this image. And here's the behind the scenes of how Andrew set up this image 
And notice how close he gets into the food. I think Rick Salmon, our friend, has a Salmonism that says, if you think you're close enough, get closer. And this <laughs> really applies to food photography. If you want the food to look mouthwatering and like you're about to take a bite of it, get in really close. I have found that a 35 millimeter lens gives you a really nice image approaching what the human eye would see, which is probably closer to about 45, uh, the, uh, 45 millimeters in uh, a regular 35 millimeter full frame format. But uh, let's take a look at, oh, I'm sorry, and a little plug for Andrew's book, which came out last year called That Photo Makes Me Hungry. This, this is a steal at, at under $17. Uh, you can get this on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Uh, this is, sorry, this is the uh, actual book. The images in here are absolutely mouthwatering. The title suits it well. And he has all different kinds of food photography images that I think will inspire almost anyone here to want to get into food photography. It is I'll tell you, I've dabbled in it with a little, uh, my, with it a little bit myself, and it's so much fun. Just look at this image here of a woman mixing uh, flour to make pasta, and you can see the motion that's introduced in here while everything is basically steady. And this just takes putting this on a tripod or a platypod for that matter, and get, giving a little bit longer shutter speed, maybe a fifteenth of a second, to allow the motion to come through. So. Highly recommend that book. Valentina Cordero is shooting her food in a high key fashion. Most of the pixels are light. And this gives you a more festive image, not as moody as those uh, images that Andrew showed, but it's a different style and will have different type of appeal. And you can see her setup over here, very, very simple. And when you have all your equipment on top of a table, it's really easy to move everything around and get just the image that you want. Now, let me go, I'm sorry, back to this for a second. And I just wanna show you how you can actually do some overhead photography because some of the food photographs and some of the restaurateurs want their photos shot straight down so you can see the entire dish. Here's a little rig that I've devised using a platypod and a Manfrotto 244 variable friction arm. You might want to write that down. And this one has a camera pad on it, and it comes all sold together. Larry, how much does that run that you know? I think it's 145 when we checked it a couple of days ago on B&H. So we can pick that up for $145. So to make this really super sturdy, I went to Home Depot and purchased two of these plastic Bessie clamps. They're lightweight. They run about 10 bucks a piece. And to give it a little extra grip, I put a little bit of um, gaffer's tape at the tip. And I like to put on two of these clamps just for security, because if just in case, you know, something knocks into one of them, you've got a backup so you don't take a risk of damaging your equipment. Very easy to apply. It's just a hand grip. Then you can load your camera right on top over here like this. And effectively, you're creating, for those of you who remember copy stands, you're creating a copy stand. Okay, we'll put this on nice and tight. The variable friction arm allows you to loosen all the joints with one single knob. You position this over the food just the way you want it. Tighten that. And even though it's way off center, those clamps are holding it nicely to the table. This is portable, you can stick in your bag, you can take it with you, and it works just beautifully and very, very versatile. So, you know, this is not something you have to go by today, but you may find that it's a, a piece of equipment that you may wanna use, and it's the only way to really mount a magic clamp, uh, I'm sorry, a magic arm, uh, easily onto a table uh, very reliably. So Dr. T, one other thing I want to point out is when you have such a heavy camera, you know, a professional camera, and it's pointed straight down looking at food for the photograph, sometimes it's going to be helpful to have a remote trigger as opposed to reaching up and, and pressing the shutter button because you'll make the camera wiggle. 
So a remote trigger is a great way to go. I have one here that you can probably purchase for, I think they're about $30, $40, uh, made by SMDV, but I think there's a lot of other brands that do it too. So it's got a little receiver. Let me, uh, let me come in a little closer here so you can see. It's got a little receiver here that goes right on your camera and a little pocket trigger right in here. And you just press the trigger and you can take a picture just like that. Very, very simple uh, to use. But the good thing about having a remote trigger is there will be no camera shake at all. And, uh, and you know, it really makes your job a lot easier when you're doing close-up photography, macro, and product photography. Yeah. And until you get, until you order your trigger and you really want to go ahead and do this, you can take pictures on a timer. So set your camera, you know, take advantage of your camera's built-in timer and set it for 10 seconds so the camera has a chance to stop shaking. But really, Dr. T is right, the best way to go with this is a, a remote trigger like that. Which will come in handy also, you'll see later on for, um, for uh, real estate photography when you have to pop a oh, flash yeah. uh, in different areas and walk around and, and fire off your camera from a distance. All righty, next, let's see, we've got... A, into beverage photography. This uh, photo was provided by our friend Don Komarechka, who is known as the mad scientist of macro photography. Uh, Don actually appeared with me on the grid uh, a few years ago when we introduced the Platyball. And uh, I'll mention Don's book in a minute also. But here he has a beer glass um, that's uh, filled up, overflowing the sides. The head is overflowing the sides. And if you look, if you look closely at this image, you can actually see motion in the bubbles there, and it's very beautifully decorated around. And again, his set, his setup is really interesting. He's got a specular sharp light flashlight actually coming off from the left hand side, and a diffuse light off at the right hand side. And what did he use as his diffuser? Nothing other than a a simple sheet of a paper towel. And again, if you go back to that image, look how beautifully, beautifully that's, uh, that's lit. Another image from Don is this spoonful of blueberries. When I first looked at this, I said, did he have a glass spoon? Am I looking at the blueberries from the underside, kind of refracted? And no, Don kind of pulled a little bit of his magic, and this is how he shot it. He had blueberries underneath this shiny spoon. And again, on top of it, and then he sprayed it with a little bit of fine mist to give it a little texture on the blueberries and the spoon. And I just, I fell in love with this image. It's just That's a great image. Beautiful. And you can see how you apply the techniques of macro photography to food photography. And last but not least, Don did another image where he just wanted to show an overhead arrangement of some berries. These are called sea buckthorn berries. They're very bitter. They're used a lot in cosmetics, uh, but Don told me he'll chew on them raw. I'm, I'm not sure I could do the same. <laughs> and just, you know, he produced this whimsical design, interestingly lit from in front of the camera, right above the camera, and then behind the subject, backlit, giving you this beautiful glow around the subject. Don also, I'm giving you guys a lot of books. Again, you don't have to buy them all or read them all at once, but this is a wonderful, wonderful book called Macro Photography, The Universe at Our Feet. This just came out about a month or two ago by Don Komarechka, and it goes through, it's basically the Bible of macro photography. And I think you'll agree that these, just, these images are just absolutely fantastic. And he shows you all his tricks, water droplet photography, fluorescent uh, photography, and um, gosh, you just, I, also, I'm sorry, Don's also an expert in snowflake photography. Yeah, that Don't just, you, Larry, down there in Florida. That just uh, amazes me. Don lives, that, that, that works pretty well. Yeah, he's got, that one is, is Doesn't noteworthy. Work. I see that one pop up every once in a while. Incredible close-up of an ant with water droplets there. Just great stuff. And, and he teaches you how to do that in his book. Now, Don's book is not yet available on Amazon. It is available, and it's the number one selling book at B&H Photo. 
Uh, he also uh, utilized Kickstarter like I did, and I think he got 2,500 backers on Kickstarter to uh, purchase uh, this book. That's and cool. it is absolutely worth every penny spent. It's about almost 400 pages, by the way. It's a, it's a hefty it's a hefty novel here. All right, next, this is my little dabble in uh, in food photography. And what's cool about this is that the whole setup to do this image, trying to kind of mimic window light, and an important point I'll make about food photography, when you're starting out, try lighting from behind the food. It brings out some tremendous depth into your view. And here, I wanted to just kick a little bit of that light back into the image, so I used a mirror to do that. And here's the setup. I have a um, the camera mounted on a platypod with a little gooseneck that you can see in the center. You see a red object, lower center, and that's one of our clamps. I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later. That's just holding a tiny pocket mirror, uh, reflecting some light back. And the main light source, and really only light source, is a platypod uh, mounted with a gooseneck, two goosenecks, and a card, and a light. And you know what? Let me let me just show you that for a second. So this is actually a, a platypod ultra, our smaller one. And we've got a card here that's just white card. You can take any white piece of paper or card. It's mounted onto a little clamp that's uh, mounted on the gooseneck. And you just turn on that light and you get this beautiful, beautiful light with soft shadows. And it just works so well. And what's really nice is, again, you can just slide this around the table, place this wherever you want. And then for the, for the other set up and I just have a mirror on a on the platypod and this mirror I'm sorry we'll move that back here we'll just kick back the light onto the subject so you can do all that with just one light can I offer just a quick suggestion to our viewers as you're seeing these things and you see Dr. T has the di different setups with the goosenecks with the lighter lights with the reflector cards the little clamps as you see a setup, a behind the scenes setup that's interesting to you, if you want to know what the gear is in that setup, just do a screenshot here. And then later after this class is over, go over to platypod.com and you'll actually be able to go through and see what all the different gear is. Oh, there's the goosenecks, there's the lighter lights, there's the clamps and those kinds of things and the ultra and the the Platypod Max. So take a screenshot just so you have a frame of reference when you're looking for the gear that Dr. T is using. I'm sorry to slow you down, Dr. T. I know we're running oh, we're a good. little bit behind, but uh, I'll let you get back to it. All right. So we'll, we'll keep moving here a little bit. I do want to touch on a lot of other stuff. Aaron Van uh, has a wonderful video of his work in food photography. Take a look at Platypod's website, go to the blog post, type in a search for Aaron Van, and you'll see about two months ago, he has a really nice video about how he did this entire setup to shoot a beautiful image of some Parmesan cheese and garlic. Aaron also has a full class on Kelby One on lighting for food photography, and I encourage you all to watch that as well. Next images, from Bob, images are from Bob Coates. Uh, Bob was on a mission to go and do some food and beverage photography over at a local uh, bar in the uh, in the uh, southwest in the Arizona uh, in, in I'm sorry in Arizona. And what's really interesting is how he lit all of this and does his visual storytelling just using a simple lighting setup. It's unobtrusive because there were people in this bar as Bob was working. So having a tripod set up you know, on the floor for people to trip over was not exactly a way to go. So what he did for lighting is he put this Godox light with a, uh, a platypod. You see the disc on the right hand uh, image uh, above right upper, upper area. And that's an Arca mounting disc. And we'll, we're going to show you how to use that. Uh, in a second. And then he's got this light bouncing off of a reflector that's held by goosenecks and clamps all in one piece that can easily be moved around. And here is the entire setup 
from a little further away. And you can see how he has the camera on the right side facing the glass. And it's just really, I'm sorry, go back a second. It's nicely lit, as you can see there. Next images from Hilmar Smith kind of whimsical. I love how Hilmar works with color. She's absolutely an expert on uh, color combinations. And in fact, she too has a Kelby One class uh, on color, uh, color theory. And you can look up her name on Kelby One and find her classes. So she's, you know, knowing that I'm a pediatrician, Hilmar wanted to bring up the topic of healthy snacks. So, well, here's an okay healthy snack from the uh, from the movie theater and she's got a little ticket in there telling a little bit more of the story but uh, she decided to do a really healthy snack with some asparagus substituting for french fries and i thought this was this was pretty cool as well jp morgan of the slanted lens and i'll mention uh, his website uh, for a minute now uh, it's something you should absolutely look absolutely look at theslantedlens.com Jay has two decades of teaching videos and uh, teaching materials up there on lighting, on composition, on video, on still photography. And uh, you learn so much from, uh, from his work. It's, it's truly amazing. So what Jay did over here was he mounted a camera upside down on a plank of wood, and that is mounted to a slider. And as you can see in the video, I'm sorry, I'm, let me get this here. Okay, as you can see in this video, the slider is going to push this camera along right through the food. And he has the food lit from the back, as we talked about before, to really bring out the depth in this image. Now, you could do this type of photography using a $1,600 24 millimeter probe lens that's made by Leowa, L A O W A but Jay did this for under a dollar together with his uh, slider and that piece of wood with the, uh, with the platypod mounted uh, upside down to it. So very, very cool. Yeah, really resourceful. Here is the website, The Slanted Lens, and uh, Jay has an eight hour video series, uh, video lesson on the art of food photography. It sells for under $60, highly recommended. I've watched this series. You will learn a tremendous amount. Uh, it goes into food styling, lighting, composition, backgrounds, and uh, you have all the basics here that you need to know to get started in food photography. Let's talk a little bit, and I'm really going to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really going to scratch the surface here, but at least point you in some direction for how to get into interior architectural and real estate photography. This image was done by uh, the Kickstarter videographer that, we, uh, that we've used, uh, Christopher Blair, together with a longtime Kelby member, J.R. Maddox, who sadly passed away at a very young age, uh, two years, I think it was two or three years ago. And uh, J.R. had gotten this beautiful venue in uh, the Los Angeles area to do some uh, kitchen shots uh, for us. And the two of them set up uh, this photo with showing off how a platypod and the new platyball, which is coming out uh, in March, although first deliveries for uh, the Kelby One uh, people who who uh, backed us in the first 24 hours, uh, those are going to be available next month. Wow. I hope that makes everybody a little bit happy. Uh, and you can see how setting the camera way back into a corner, as opposed to putting it two feet further ahead, but pay, putting it way back into a corner or onto a surface can give you a really nice wide view. You could even stick it into a cabinet and, and get the, the kind of wide view that you saw over here. That is one of the hardest things about architectural photography is being able to get back far enough. And again, you need a, a remote trigger to be able to fire the camera when it's in that kind of out of the way place on a shelf or something. Or as you said, run a 10 second timer and just get out, get out of the way. Yeah. Uh, Christoph Bernard illustrates this point also. There was really nowhere in this little living room to get such a nice wide shot. And you'll find that 
your sweet zone for getting ultra wide pictures for interior real estate photography is somewhere between 18 and 20 millimeters. If you want to go ultra wide, once you go well below that, you start to introduce a lot of distortion. And if you'll notice the, some of the, um, tilt shift lenses that architectural photographers use are 19 millimeters right in that zone. So there's a little tip for you. Charlene Sliding, who is a, uh, is a uh, real estate photographer in the Chicago area, and Charlene's busy. She's doing about eight to ten real estate jobs a week. She's got to get in and out relatively quickly. But she also illustrates, and there's a lot to talk about in this image, but I'll, I'll just briefly introduce it. So she puts her camera way in the corner. She tried putting a tripod in between the center island, and these cabinets off to the left and was missing most of the shot. The only way to really get these kind of images was to mount the camera, as you see here, on the counter. Otherwise, had she gone in between the counter <coughs> and the oven, she would have missed that oven altogether. I want to go back a little bit uh, here also to is illustrate some points. There's three main methods of shooting uh, interior real estate or interior architectural. Method one, if you want to be able to bring the outside windows like we have here uh, into the view without them blowing out, you can try to use HDR technique and I'll refer you uh, to uh, Rick Salmon's work on HDR photography and others. Or you can do what's known as flambient, flash ambient photography and I'll uh, suggest that you take a look at a photographer named Nathan Cool. Let me, uh, let me just show you a second. Nathan's got a book series on real estate photography, but this one that I picked up, and it was not expensive at Amazon, Photography for Real Estate Interiors. And this goes over how to use that flash ambient technique and how to do what's known as a window pull to be able to pull in the imagery from the window. It involves usually taking three exposures and processing them in Photoshop. But once you learn how to do this, the processing takes no more than two minutes. It's amazing. You can, he, he does a technique where he'll over flash the window frames and that allows him to just use a darken blend mode to bring in the outside. And again, I'll refer you to Nathan's book for that or you can look up Nathan Cool on YouTube. He has a series of videos that go into that. So thank you Charlene for these just beautiful images. Please remember Photoshop 20, no spaces, the case doesn't doesn't matter. Photoshop 20 between now and September 10th will get you to our uh, will get you to our uh, I'm sorry, on our website, we'll get you a, a discount. Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my breath here a second. Okay. And yeah. also, when you go onto the website, take a look at the Platypod ecosystem. And please enter our food photography contest, which is taking place between now and the end of September. It ends the first week of October. It we do ask that you submit one photo, a final photo, and a behind the scenes shot showing that you used a platypod in one form or another, essentially to make your, uh, to make your image. We've got some great prizes, including uh, three items in the gear category and three item, four items in the growth category. Uh, the growth category are basically uh, learning materials, including a three session mentorship with Aaron Van, the food photographer. So you'll want to look at the, uh, at the details on that. And very simple to uh, apply for this. We are allowed uh, three separate submissions to each contestant, and we will judge those in the first week or so of October. Uh, the platypods are better by the bundle. And uh, look at our website for several different bundles for lighting, uh, we have good specials and your 20% discount code will also um, will also save you on the bundles as well. I had one more image 
I wanted to bring in, but hang on just one second. Let me see if I can, if I can get that. Everybody get ready to screenshot because Dr. T is going to bring up the, um, uh, the code so that you can save money over at platypod.com. So the code is, um, was it uh, Photoshop? Photoshop 20. Photoshop, Photoshop 20. 20. There it is. Take a picture of that. Yep. Screenshot that or iPhone shot that or something. And that's only good through September 10th but it's for everything over at platypod.com. Okay, and just, I'm sorry, there was one image I was, I was missing here, and let me see if I can find that, and otherwise, nope, can't find the image. I'm sorry about that. Also, okay. while, while you're uh, at platypod.com, that's where the Crave contest is, so make sure that you enter, and do definitely include your behind the scenes. That's so important. Because Dr. T, as you know, he loves teaching how people get the shots, not just that they get the shot. And that's what the Crave Contest is all about. Exactly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of our, uh, some of our equipment to do this. And, uh, and if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Were there any questions so far, Larry, that you wanted to bring up? I have, I have several in the queue. But we'll get to those. Um, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, most of you are familiar with Platypod Max and Platypod Ultra. These are your tripod legs. And onto this, you'll attach your own ball head, or you can use one of ours. We have this little one from Venro that attaches onto it. And then you can add your camera onto that and just mount it here. We'll show you that a little bit more in a second. So, Max is for for bigger cameras and also for the more complex setups. You can uh, add on, I would say, five sets of goosenecks onto here if you want to. And so if you have something that complex, I would suggest Max for that. If you have a smaller setup like the one I showed you before with the reflector card, Ultra will work just fine. This is quite a bit smaller. Max, just to give you an idea, is the size of a, uh, of a uh, iPad mini and Ultra is about the size of an iPhone. The goosenecks come in a pair. Here's the, here's the package for it. They come in a pair like this. And the reason they come in pairs is that they are stackable. Now, they're built male on one end, female on the other end. But we do also include a little thing called a cross, cross knot adapter, which will allow you to convert the female end to male. And what's nice about this is you just take it and you can mount it right onto your platypod very very simple and now you can put on different objects on, on here and what do we have that we can you can put on here well let's start with some lights we have here a Lytra torch light now to give you an idea of how bright this thing is this is on low this is on medium and this is on high i can't even look into this light it's it's so bright and you can mount this either end on or on the side onto your uh, gooseneck. These are uh, rechargeable with a lithium battery here. On low power, you could probably run about uh, two hours or so. High power, I would say about 45 minutes. But if you want to run them for a long time, then just hook them up with a cable. They come with a, a little um, a micro uh, USB cable that will plug into here or you can use an extender on that and this will then stay on for hours and hours. Dr. T, can I, can I point out something really quick that I noticed about the, uh, the goosenecks? My total experience with goosenecks in life was like a, a, a gooseneck uh, desk lamp and the gooseneck fought back and it wasn't real, you know, it didn't, didn't stay in position. And I get these platypod goosenecks and put them on my platypod max and then I put those lights on. They are so nice because you can actually aim them wherever you want to aim them and they stay. So imagine if you're just getting into product photography, food photography, macro photography, something like that, and your camera is on a tripod in front of you and you're holding these lights around in different places with your hands, well, now you can move those lights into position. And if they're on the goosenecks, 
the lights will stay exactly where they are and then you can take those photos. It's just, it's such a wonderful experience as a product photographer to have those goosenecks hold the lights exactly where you put them as you're looking through, through the viewfinder. Thank you, Larry. I, I agree 100% here. Now, so another item that we have that you can mount onto here are these little clamps. We call it the mini super clamp. And these have both a quarter inch and a three eighth inch socket on them. So this will just mount onto a gooseneck like this. They will open up to about an inch and a half. You can mount a pipe on here, a branch. You can mount a flashlight or pick up at Amazon a little mirror for about $4, uh, or I got this nicer metal one for about 6 or $7. And now you just clamp your mirror on here. And what this lets you do is you use your light as a main light and use the mirror to reflect that light. Let's get that on there real well. And you can just place that on your subject and reflect it back like that. Oops, sorry. So very cool. Isn't Dr. T, isn't that the setup that Shiv Verma put the fork into that clamp for That's the correct. for the uh, pasta shot that he had? That's correct. And we have we have uh, nature uh, wildlife photographers who are, you know, shooting images of reptiles where they need them crawling around a branch. So this is great for holding up little branches and things. Again, for we've got people since we put these out for sale only about a week, a week and a half ago. Um, people are grabbing these up two to four at a time because they're so incredibly handy and, and they're not expensive. You take a look, take a look on our website and you'll see, you'll see that. Okay. Another light that we have that I want to show you is this is something also new. We've only introduced in the past two weeks. This is from LumaCube. It is the LumaCube panel pro light and I'm just going to lay this down here and go in close up over here and what's cool about this well there's several cool things about this but here you go is that you can operate this from your iPhone or any smartphone for that matter and you can adjust brightness Oh, let's, let's get the right one here. Okay, brightness. Wow. Color temperature. So it goes from a rather amber color temperature for tungsten light all the way up to cool daylight. But it's also a full color RGB light. So you can use it to light up backgrounds red or green or blue or anything in between on the spectrum by just using this little color wheel. I can go to orange or magenta. So very cool light. And we do have that in some of our kits on uh, platypod.com. And again, please look through. There's some video information about that as well. And I think you'll enjoy looking at that. Uh, I think we've talked about most of our equipment. Now, the other things that you need, let me come back on here. The other things that you're going to need for food photography, you need dishes, you need glasses, utensils, towels that will look pretty in the image, and as well as backgrounds and tabletops. And there's a company called V Flats, which now makes a surface board and a background board that are mounted together with like an L. Uh, clamp on it and you can lay out food on there and it looks like you're in somebody's kitchen uh, that is actually one of the prizes in the uh, in the crave contest and I'd encourage you to go over to vflats.com and uh, and check check those out as well the one thing I didn't mention here and I'm not going to go to in any detail is the plata ball this is our new ball head I've talked about this a lot at other uh, Kelby conferences you can also look this up on our website at platypod.com or platyball.com and see what is so special about this ball head. But if you're entertaining the idea of getting a really heavy duty ball head, 
but one that doesn't have any knobs, instead works with push buttons, has a built-in LED leveling indicator. Uh, you may want to wait for next March to get that, but our Platypod people will, will see that. Uh, I'm sorry, our uh, Kelby One people, some of them will see that earlier if they backed us in the first 24 hours on Kickstarter. I didn't talk about our multi-accessory kit, and we've spoken about this uh, in the past. Multi-accessory kit includes a 36-inch cinch strap if you want to strap the, the platypod onto objects. It also includes, our new one includes a carabiner, little spigot adapter. If you want to raise up your camera another three inches, then just put one of our cross nuts on here that's available uh, with the platypod, comes with the platypod max, and also a little, what's called a, uh, excuse me, I'm having a senior moment here, a, a little bushing adapter, that's it, bushing adapter to raise that up to, um, to a 3 8 inch, which will now fit on the bottom of your ball head. And you can use that like Valentina Cordell uh, used to pick up the uh, ball head a little bit higher like that. It's also used as well for uh, monolights and for umbrella adapters for lighting equipment. But the main thing, oh, and also we have a uh, little rubber pad to protect the surface that you're putting your platypod on. Spend one or two minutes just on this, and I, th I think we're gonna take some, some questions after that because the time is running. Yes, please. Short. This is our new ARCA compatible quick release disc. It's the first one in the world like it. ARCA refers to the groove system that you have on most quick release plates other than the Manfrotto plates, okay? They will go on to any quick release clamp like this one or like the one we have on the Plata Ball and allow you to mount your camera on here quickly. What's special about our quick release plate is that it doesn't require what, what this has, which is a little D-ring with an Allen wrench socket or a coin socket that kind of hurts your fingers to put on, or you've got to use tools to get that on. This will spin on tool free. You just get it into your camera a little bit and then just spin the rest, lock it in. And now you can mount this. Let's do this here quickly. Use the flat of all here. Now you can mount this onto your ball head. And by the way, Plata Ball is gonna come with one of these discs too, but right now it, it is available in the, uh, the multi-accessory kit. Larry, did I miss anything before we take some Q&A? No, I think you got it for the gear. And one of the questions, ironically, goes right to one of the things that I know that you wanted to cover. Um, one of our viewers tonight, Steve said, can we get them to slow down on the product recommendations? It's hard to get screenshots or write them down. And he was talking about the, um, the books and the learning materials that you went through. So Dr. T, can you, can you quickly, just everybody get ready with your screenshots. Okay. Can you, Dr. T is gonna quickly go through these books that he mentioned and uh, other websites and, and places to go. All right, number one, Light, Science, and Magic. That's on Amazon. The uh, author is the late Phil Hunter, F-I-L Hunter. This is the fifth edition. I think it's in its sixth edition already. The hard, the hardcover one's pretty expensive. That's about 160. The soft cover is much less. I think forty dollars or so. Very well worth it. It's a uh, three hundred eighty-page book. Yep. Loads of pictures. But this really is the principles of lighting. And that one, Dr. T, that one, that one is on Amazon. And when we're getting to Don Komarechka's book, it is not. But the next book you're going to show is on Amazon, yes? Oh, no. Uh, the next one, yeah, the Nathan Cool book. Yep. And this is called Photography for Real Estate Interiors. That's on Amazon. And it's part of, I think, a six or eight part series on real estate photography. And he'll talk about the business of it, which we should mention also for, for a second or two. I think we have a, a few minutes to do that. Yeah, um, we're, getting, we're getting tight on time, so let's zip through the other okay. uh, resources. Macro photography, the universe at our feet. 
by Don Kamarechka. And this is available at BNH. I think if you just go to BNH and type in macro photography, you'll find this. Okay. And Andrew Scrivani's book, That Photo Makes Me Hungry. In fact, the cover makes me hungry. And that's available on Amazon. Now, just a word about, about earning some revenue in photography. Today, with the with the uh, pandemic that's been going on, you know, restaurants still have to do takeout work and they want their images posted online. And if you can go to a restaurant, take a really nice image and give the restaurant owner a 16 by 10 blow up of that image on acrylic print or on a metal print. And you can go to MPix or some of the other uh, so, or Bay Photo or some of the other places that will process for you, you'll earn a friend for life and you will probably end up photographing all of that restaurant's materials. So that's a great way to do it. If you're a wedding photographer, you're at a wedding, take images of the interesting food. Do the same, send something to the caterer. They will not only get you for images of their food, but you'll probably get a few wedding gigs uh, out of that too. Look for people doing cookbooks in your neighborhood churches, temples, see if they're interested in having some food photography done. It's a great way to get your name out there. People will see that and you will be able to get you know more jobs that way. For real estate, get to know your local real estate agents. Take some exterior pictures, something beautiful at dusk, light it up nicely. Ask an agent if you can do maybe a free interior session for them. If you do the job well, but study, this is a whole different area of photography and you have to know your lighting. And uh, I, think, I think you can do very nicely like that. So before we get to the questions, don't forget to go to www.platapod.com. We've got loads of materials. Sign up, please, for our monthly newsletter. That goes out once a month. We don't flood you with, with emails, but it is also how you will learn about new products that we're uh, introducing. You'll... Uh, Find some discounts and specials on there as well. And if we run a new, when we run our next Kickstarter, you'll find out about it there first. Please enter the Crave co contest. You got nothing to lose. I'm only expecting a few dozen contestants because everybody's scared of this field. Don't be scared. Get out there. Do something. You got nothing to lose. Enter the contest. And it's a great way to make a name for yourself. And please ap apply the 20% promo code of Photoshop 20, and you will also get free shipping on all orders over $100. Now we've got five minutes for some Q&A, yep. and let's go ahead, Larry. All right, so we'll jump right in with um, the first question, which is from Hylos Barrett, and it is, how is the iPhone holder fastened to the ball head? So the iPhone- Very good question. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. First of all, if you look on our website, uh, we offer something called a square jellyfish iPhone holder. I've been using these for four or five years. They are outstanding. They fold up super compact. They'll work in portrait or landscape mode, and they will fit on any tripod because they have a quarter inch socket at the bottom. And then all I do is take either our little disc adapter, or you can take any Arca, any Arca compatible disc adapter, and I'll just spin that right on here and you can either mount it directly to the platypod because the dip disc adapter has a 3 8 inch socket at the bottom and just put your phone on like this you'll be able to tilt back and forth a little bit if you really want to have full mobility uh with that then i would say mount this onto a uh a ball head and then you will have free movement wherever you like. Okay, so that I hope answers that question and it is available on our website. Uh, next question is, are platypods and accessories available in retail stores or just online via the website and are they available overseas? So some of the items you've heard about today are only on our website. Uh, you can get Platypod Max Ultra the goosenecks and the multi-accessory kit on Amazon. 
and at B&H. B&H has our, uh, our items bundled with some other accessories, which you might want to take a look at. Uh, but th those are excellent resources here. In England, we are at Leeds Photo. In Europe, the rest of the uh, EU, we're available on enjoyyourcamera.com and in Japan through Ginichi. All righty. Next question is, Diane A. would like to know, what is the name of those big clamps? So I guess the ones that you got at Home Depot to clamp the uh, yeah. Platypod Max to the table. And I can tell you that the brand that Dr. T is showing is different from what is in the Home Depot in my hometown, but I've seen very similar, and I actually bought some very similar uh, grip clamps. They're just so much faster than the old school right. so, C-clamp. Basically, you want a grip clamp. This one, these were like $10 a piece, but they, they, they come in metal. So uh, just go over to your local, your local Home Depot or Lowe's and you'll find uh, several different, and just pick whatever feels right to you. I like these because they're very lightweight, but you do, the, the only criticism I had was they, they're kind of slippery for the plastic, so I added on a little bit of gaffer's tape onto there. Next question. Next one is from Linda C, and it is, what app is Dr. T using for the light right now? So this would be the light uh, that you are controlling remotely. Sure, so that's an app from LumaCube, and when you purchase the uh, LumaCube light, there's a reference in the box to the app, so it's their own app uh, that, that works together with this. But you don't have to use that. It also has a nice bright display back here and controls that you can control it locally without an app as well. Very good, Dr. T. We are down to, down to the wire, and I have a comment and a question. The question is, is the 35 millimeter lens that you recommended for food photography? So, yes, th this happens to be a Tamron uh, 1.8. I think this has been discontinued and they have now a 1.4 lens. But what's great about this lens is it'll, it'll allow you to come about this close to your subject. Wow. Really give you a nice view. But you can use any macro lens uh, to do that. And John Espo says, I just purchased the new clamps. They came in a few days and I've already had, uh, already started to play with them in between presentations. <laughs> so he's They're using a lot them now. Of fun. There's so many things you can do with them and, and I'm looking forward to seeing what um, our uh, audience will do with them. And again, please join the Crave contest. Uh, we want to get people excited about food photography. I think this will be really be great. Dr. T, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, lots of educational materials, some inspiring ways to make some money as a photographer. And next up, what we have coming is Joe McNally. So an evening with Joe McNally is following the famous Dr. T and the Platypod presentation. Stick around for an evening with Joe McNally. You're going to have a great time and a great experience. Dr. T, one more time, thank you again so much. Folks. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. Special thanks to Scott Kelby for allowing me to be here. I appreciate it.